Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guests this evening. Across an acclaimed body of work, Edwige Dantica bears witness to the complexities of Haitian life in stories of courage, brutality, family, rebellion, and beauty. She's the author of numerous books, including The Art of Death, Claire of the Sea Light, Brother I'm Dying, The Dew Breaker, and Breath, Eyes, Memory. Her many honors include the 2018 Neustadt International Prize for Literature, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and a MacArthur Fellowship. In her newest book, the short story collection, Everything Inside, we are given eight powerful tales of diaspora, love, loss, and sometimes redemption. Tonight, she'll be joined in conversation with Glory Adam, founder of Well-Read Black Girl, a book club turned literary festival based in Brooklyn that provides a vital space for black women readers and writers to connect and grow in conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Edwige Dantica and Glory Adam to the Free Library. Hi there. <laughs> Hello to all of you. Thank you for coming. Yes. <laughs> Oh boy, it's going to be a lively crowd. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. We want a lively crowd. Um, that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you to the Free Library for having us today. Thank you for being here. We are so excited to celebrate your latest collection and the work that you do. As, as you can tell, we are so excited to be here and to see you just continue to flourish. Um, Everything inside, everything inside your book moves me completely, per usual. Thank you. <laughs> and I just, I think that the first thing I want to start off with is just the inspiration behind it, and especially with the title and these eight beautiful stories that share so much. Where, where did that thought or concept come from? Um, again, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Glory, for she came all the way from New York on the train to do this. So, <laughs> so thank you. Um, so everything inside, um, I live in a very uh, gentrifying neighborhood now in Miami and Little Haiti, and I was walking around the neighborhood one day, and I saw this sign that looked like a sort of a stop sign, but... It was obviously meant to be menacing. It was in, in, in some of one of our new neighbor's windows that said, nothing inside is worth dying for. And then I was like reading and I was like, what does that mean? And then I realized it, it was meant to be like, if you come in here, whatever happens to you, you know, as we say in Creole, zul granu, like your grandmother's bones, you know? Um, and so, um, and, and then I was like, oh wow, like, and so I, I was like, I have to put that in a story because it seemed so like such a strange thing. And then, and in the story, I flipped it to everything inside is worth dying for, because that seemed like the opposite of that message, yeah. right? That there's so much that's worth dying for. It's like the story, like, um, or it seemed the other, you know, sign was kind of you know a parallel to xenophobia, like stay out. And right. and this was more. It's like the flipping of it. And so I wanted to. And then I put that in the first story, Dosas, and I wanted to um, call the whole book Everything Inside is Worth Dying For. And then I had a conversation with my editor, and then we pondered the fact that you know critics would have too much fun with like, not much inside is worth dying for. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the way that people can get clever. So I thought, I, and then so we just um, decided to call it Everything Inside. You know? I think what would be really magnificent is if you could read for us. Yeah, just let's start it off with your voice and the words. Um, it's a, it's a sh I'll stay in the chair because it's, such a, sh it's a short read, but this, um, the, the bit I'll read is from a, the last story in the collection, which is the most, of the most recent of the stories. So these are stories that I've been writing for a very long time, um, and I, I guess I kept rewriting. I would change and add things to... But the story is called Without Inspection, and I, um, I decided to write the story when I, I went to an immigration forum sometime last year with, with immigration lawyers, and, um, and they were talking about temporary protected status, and they would talk about people who had, 
who had come to the US with entry without inspection. So if you come without inspection, that means you've never seen an immigration official, you might have come by boat, you might have come through the border, and that means that it's like you're not here. So Arnold is this gentleman who is in, um, who came that way, and, and, a, and a woman who had also lost her husband in the same way that, that he came, made it a habit to go on the beach and meet the boats. And so Arnold, the, this is that one story, aspect of the story, but then he ends up having an accident on a construction site and falls several feet. I'm at this age where it's like the glasses are on one minute. The glasses are on. <laughs> We're just talking about that backstage. She just had LASIK, I'm jealous. I can see. <laughs> um, so this is um, Arnold's fall, and when, when he falls, he lands in a cement mixer. This landing was even more abrupt than his last one. His free fall ended as his body slammed into the drum of the cement mixer. He was being tossed inside a dark blender full of grout. Every few seconds, his face would emerge from under the wet, pounded sand and pebbles and he would keep his mouth closed, trying to force air out through his nose and push away the grainy mix that his body was forcing him to inhale. He pretended he was swimming and tried to flutter kick, just as he had when the speedboat stopped in the middle of the ocean and he was told by the captain to swim ashore. He attempted arm strokes, but couldn't move either his arms or his legs. Still, his body was in constant motion because the mixer continued to turn and turn. He reached for the shaft, what in a more stable space, in a house or some temple or some other holy place you might call a potomita, a middle pillar. He used what was left of his strength to propel his body towards the shaft and wrap his arms around it. He was trying to hold on and was only able to hold on briefly before he was pulled in another direction. He felt lighter now, even lighter than he had when falling. His bones were melting, his blood evaporating, and he was now like something porous, tulle, or the white eyelet lace that Darlene loved. He had not been paying attention to the alternating hum and jangle of the mixer. He hadn't noticed that there were streaks of blood polluting the cement or that he was feeling absolutely no pain. Then the mixture stopped spinning and he heard the stillness, which was soon replaced by screams and grunts and, oh my God. Then he heard the sirens, which took him back to the beach, to the gray sand and Darlene's face. From where he was lying inside the cement mixer, he saw an airplane cut across the clear blue sky, and that was when he realized that he was dying, and his dying offered him a kind of freedom that he had never had before. Whatever he thought about, he could now see in front of him. Whatever he wanted, he could have, except what he wanted most of all, which was not to die. Right, right, right. The beauty of that passage and the reality of it at the same time. So, so you have this man in his last moments and you describe it so detailed and so, so um, with so much humanity. When you're writing a story like that, how do you bring yourself to tell the details but also keep the soul and the spirit of the person intact? Well, the first thing I, I always think when I'm writing a, a story, especially stories in which people are in pain, you, um, I always try, like, I, you feel the pain, like, writing it. Like, I, I, you're trying to um, inhabit some of the pain, but I always remember that whatever it is for me, writing it is nothing like what it was like for somebody living it, right. and, um, and how much comes through us from that, from that, that trauma, you know, that the gentleman in the story had already gone through so much trauma um, and, and was looking for a better possibility and still comes into that. But um, I, it's so, you know, 
it's, um, we're probably gonna talk about Ms. Morrison at some point, but I, I remember when, um, when she was talking about Beloved, right, and said, um, you, have to, you, you have to think about that's not a father, that's your father. Right. Right, and that's not, some, that's not a baby, that's your baby. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's, um, that's how I, you know, like it, ha it's like it, could be, it could have been my, my father going through that. And it was in some ways, you know, a possibility for the life of my father. So just really having ownership of that, like being part of that, feeling like the story is not a, a story, but it is also my story. Yeah. I mean, it's so apparent in every single one of the stories that feels like there is a personal connection that you have. How much of it is it drawn from your personal experience or from your vivid imagination or things that are just happening day to day? Yeah. Well, the, in this case, there was a, a time in Miami um, where, um, and it always made, took me back to sort of this mythology of flying, but there was also this reality of people who were immigrants who were building these really very big buildings who would fall yeah. off of them during the, the process of the construction. And, and it happened so often and sometimes, um, and like in the case of this, this gentleman, there were people who were working under names that were not their own. Yeah. So in their last moments, they were called somebody else's name mm. because they were, they were working with different papers. Yeah. Um, and sometimes their relatives didn't know that it was them for a long time. And so it was something that, that was occurring a lot. And, um, and there were the, the people, like the construction company would always have the same statement, which is in the story, yeah of it's like we regret this, you know, this accident, there'll be an ex investigation, and then you never heard anything again, and you right. never knew what happened to these people. And there was a really horrible case of a man who had fallen into quick cement. Oh, so, um, which literally, it, it, it felt like something from another, I like had to be carved out, mm -hmm. you know, of this, because he was already entombed yeah. um, with the fall, so. Um, Usually things like I, a lot of the stories and uh, people will say they're sad, but I, I often, I tend to write things I can't, that haunt me. Mm. And, um, and this was that, like the, the image of these, of these men, and they were mostly men falling to their deaths from these, you know, these um, massive m manifestations <laughs> of, you know, of like what people consider beautiful in the city. Right. And they were often building things that they would never, be able to live in too. I am. I'm a fan of reading a lot of your interviews. I have the the essay collection from Mississippi Press, the Conversation series, oh. and in one of the conversations, you're quoted as saying, "You're told you don't belong to American literature, or you're told that you don't belong to Haitian literature. Maybe there's a place on the hyphen." Um, would you agree with that? Do you feel like your, your work and your, your legacy still lives on the hyphen, or has, has that transformed? Well, I, in it, when I just started, right, people would say, well, for Haitian literature, people would say, well, Haitian literature is written in either French or Creole. There's no Haitian literature in English, so you can't really be a Haitian writer. And, Which um, seems ridiculous. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, it's, I, I, you know, but then I was feeling like, I feel like as writers, we're not meant to follow rules anyway. Right. So I thought, you know, I, for that. Like, I thought, you know, whatever the rules are, because for me, it was always about like, just I just want to do this work yeah. because it's like what I'm passionate about. It's what I love. I don't care where people put me or when they, you know, and then I think for American literature, it's like you're an immigrant writer. And, and so, so I, I, and I remember reading Julia Alvarez, mm -hmm. who wrote an essay about that from something to declare, hey, it's some Julia. <laughs> and so what, what Julia said, she told this story. I mean, it's, it, it's, it was f it's very, it's something that's very familiar to many of us who write in, in another language and then you go home to, you know, you're invited to some gathering back, you know, in, in your home. And so she talks, she describes this, and this m gathering where she was invited mm -hmm. And then she's put on the stage with the grand dame of Dominican literature, and the and the grand dame turns to her and say, you know, you are not Dominican. Come back to your country and write in your own language. Wow. 
And then so she wrote the essay as like, you know, in those moments where things like that are happening, you're like, I'm going to have a really good answer in about two weeks. But, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but right now, I'm just embarrassed. <laughs> right. And so, so when she had her good answer, she wrote it as her essay. It was called, With Your Permission, Donia, so-and-so. Oh, wow. And then she talked about like this sort of the iPhone. And, 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 and I often, I think of the iPhone as an island, kind of like these islands that where we, where we come from. It's kind of like this floating island in between. But I, but I, but I wasn't like, I was never, um, I think it's probably a result of being a child of migration. I was never to anybody, claim me please. Like that was never to me the primary purpose of this work, yeah. you know. I, I love, um the title of that essay, you know, uh, with your permission, right? Yeah. You know, so. And I think it's the, also the Spanish. It's like you're trying to be like, she's an elder, so mm -hmm. she was trying to be respectful. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, yeah, the you said to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, with that, can you share who, the, who gave you permission to write? I know we were breaking the rules, but where there are like literary foremothers, and especially in the black literary tradition that inspired you very early on. Yeah, well, the the very very first book I I read in English in the United States was Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, and and I I literally read it with a dictionary, <laughs> and and I remember reading it and thinking like it was so like revealing and and I was coming also you know from a culture of dictatorship like mm -hmm. my. And, and from the time I was, you know, like you're a small kid, you're told like there are things you can't say to people. Yeah. You have to watch how you speak to people. You have to like what you say because, you know, you can like, you know, you could say something and then like have your whole family be in danger. Right. So you were very, people were very careful with their words. And I remember reading that and I was like, oh my God, this is, she's telling us everything, <laughs> you know. And, and then, and I was like, and then she walks around. She's like, she's beautiful. She's amazing. She's like like a queen mm -hmm. and 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 it's like but this there's still this these stories yeah. that you know and then I you know and I kept reading through as they were published but when I I remember like I feel like Breath Eyes Memory would not have been written if I had not read I Know Why wow. the Cage Bird Sings because I felt braver oh, you know yeah. having read that text I felt like Oh, you can write that stuff you know <laughs> and, yeah. like, and then and then I felt like and then I I was able to I, you know, I felt like that gave me permission to write boldly about sexuality and abuse, and 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 you know, I, I caught some hell for it, but, <laughs> but 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 I felt like, oh, it's okay, it's okay to do that, you know, as you know, that was like from the from the beginning, also transitioning um, between languages, and and you know, and also it's it was. The, the writer, I have, wasn't allowed, you know, you weren't taught Haitian writers in school when I was, when I was writing, so when I was growing up, so yeah. also, and be, when I got here, I just went and read through like the whole Haitian um, writer's canon, and there was a writer, Marie-Vie Chauvet, mm -hmm. who is an extraordinary uh, woman writer from Haiti, writer, who right before like her big book, which was, has been translated as Love, Anger, and Madness, right before her big book was about to be published in France. Like, the ambassador to Haiti came and, and said to her, you know, if that book is published, your entire family is going to be killed. So they had to, with, you know, they, they had to, the family bought all 5,000 copies of the book, um, which was distributed over time, over the years, like, in secret until finally, you know, now it's in translation. But her story, and she died in exile in New York um, in her f in, in her fifties. Mm -hmm. So just like having, when you talk about four mothers, kind of like having right. those stories, and then you know, like you have that. You know, you read I know I did Cage Bird Sings. You read um, My Yves Chauvet, and you're like, what am I complaining about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. that I don't get paid enough. That I don't. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it just it shows when you're saying, you know, you lived in a space of dictatorship and the, then it's like the real consequences of it, right? Like I think a lot of times we can theorize and we can watch the news and we can think we 
we think we know, but when, when you have someone come to your house and say, I'm going to kill your whole family because of your book, because yeah. of your truth, that changes everything. Oh, yeah. um, the reality of it and just the risk. The, I, I actually quoted you today on, um, on our Instagram just talking about this, you know, the reason that you write and creating dangerously is because you are risking that person out there. I'm paraphrasing you, obviously. <laughs> but that person out here, you're doing it so someone can find it and read it, you know? Like, you don't know who that will, those words will save in the future. Um, and you do that so eloquently in every single book. Uh, to get back to this, this, this collection, um, you know, there's so much you explore, you know, love, death, betrayal. Um, and it also feels very timely. Uh, and earlier you mentioned something just about the immigrant story. Is this, were you intentional when you were writing this that this would be a story that was, could share the livelihood and the reality of immigrants or the Haitian experience? Well, I think also I've always lived in, in or near immigrant communities yeah. and I, I think there's so many things that maybe we hear more about now that immigrants always living, especially right. poor immigrants, right? right? It's like especially poor black immigrants yeah. always living the, um, you know, the, the shadows mm -hmm. um, and all of these things. There's so much tougher now because, for example, you know, starting in October with the new rules, there are going to be so many people who are going to be afraid to take their sick kid to a clinic yeah. because now if you have sought public assistance, if you've, if you've gone to a, you know, if you've done anything, if the, the state or has helped you in any way, they might not give you your green card, yeah. right? Um, if so, there's that now, there, there's sort of some very real and, and drastic and, and um, repercussions that people mm -hmm. are living and that like, I've lived in Miami for a long time. I, I, I'd never seen an ICE, you know, like vehicle in yeah. the wild. You see them all the time right, now. Right. And sometimes you see them in front of like clinics, even yeah. if it's or, like- Or bus stations. My, my, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm for also a first generation and, um, um, excuse me, I'm first generation, my parent, both my parents are Nigerian, and my mom takes the bus all the time to visit me in New York, mm -hmm. and recently, uh, she, she doesn't, you know, she's not a, a United States citizen, and so I've been telling her not to take the bus, because it's been such a thing where she keeps getting, like, pulled over or asking and to see papers. get on the bus. Yeah, yeah. and so, so I'm yeah. just like, okay, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna figure out a new system, because you shouldn't be taking the yeah. bus anymore, but that's never a thing we thought about. Yeah, and you know? so, I mean, and so those are, I mean, I think that that exist, but unless it's maybe on the news yeah. or so if you're in these communities like people have always had the fears the um, so I, I I don't feel like then I was writing stories to the moment there yeah. were things that I think people are always facing people have been Haitian you know Haitian people have been coming um, by boat since the 80s to Miami yeah. and um, and so I, I feel like those stories are always there, but the, there's these elements of them that people don't hear about if you're not in the community. For example, one of the, um, in a, a, when I was writing Without Inspection, this particular event was in my mind. Mm -hmm. There was a young woman who um, came to Miami on a boat. She had a young man she was in love with in Miami. Her parents didn't even know mm -hmm. that she was coming, so she just got on the boat um, and and um, and came to Miami and and a lot of people, just in, in the story, you get cool people, when you could see the shore, mm -hmm. people are told to swim yeah. because the the person who's a trafficker or so forth is who's bringing them is not going to land their boat. They're just gonna. So a lot of people don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. So this young woman drowned, and I had just moved to the to Miami in the community, and then so they of course they her parents couldn't come and they weren't, they didn't have enough money to even, you know, repatriate the body. Mm -hmm. So people in the community got together and, and had a service for her mm -hmm. that we could all come to. Yeah. And so I feel like that part of it we don't see, right? right? Like if, if you see someone comes with their child, you're like, that per they don't love their children because they're crossing deserts with them. Right, right. But we don't see the, we don't see the reasoning behind like why someone would make that that sacrifice, right. you know, and so, um, and I feel like that's where the fiction, that's where we can fill in that space. That's where artists, you know, writers, singers, we can write a song about that. We can, yeah. we can write a story about that. We can paint that. We can like that nuance, that gray area, yeah. that people maybe don't want to see. Like right. they don't want to hear about it. They want their simple, you know, narratives and right. and and 
that's where art complicates things, you know. And challenges and reveals things mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, throughout this conversation, you've, you've mentioned the sea, and I, I love like your relationship with the landscape and uh, nature in that way. Uh, you, like even in Crick Crack, it opens with the sea, you know, Children, yeah, of, the Children sea. of the Sea. Yeah, yeah. and um, in, so many, in so many of your collections, there's like this relationship with bodies of water. Can you elaborate, on, and this is just my inquisitiveness as well, mm -hmm. like what is your relationship with the, the ocean? Is it like a spiritual experience for you? And how, how does that show up in your, in your writing? Well, I, f I think, you know, I think the Oak Walcott was at the sea, his history, mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, Tony Cade Bambara, the sea's memory. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's how we got here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so it's, and I, I had always, like in, in Quick Crack, the story that opens the book is Children of the Sea. Yeah. And, um, and we've, you know, the Haitians, uh, we've lost a lot of people to the sea. Yeah. Like we don't even know how many in that in this modern crossing, yeah. right from Haiti, sometimes to the Bahamas, to Miami, to other places. Mm -hmm. And I remember always initially, uh, there's a story that I could crack called "Children of the Sea," and um, and and as a kind of comfort, you know, I think there's there's a spiritual comfort in, in in all of this because it had there has to be right because right. there has to have some to make some sense, at least for the, for the next generations. But I would to always think about the, the, the people who were doing the crossing from Haiti, mm -hmm. you know, meeting, falling into the arms of our ancestors who yeah. had made that crossing, yeah. you know, from the continent. So, um, so the sea, I think also being in an island surrounded by, there's so many expressions too in Creole that have to do with the sea. Um, you know, one of the, worse that became politicized was um, one of our presidents, he said, he would say, like swim, and it literally, it, li it literally means swim to get out, but it's oh. like, it's like when something is impossible, mm. it's like you're like, I'm like trying to, to get out, but the sea is so endless. It's kind yeah. of like if somebody's like, okay, like, you know, but you can't, it's like something that seems impossible. So the sea is just the, being around us on, on these islands. Yeah. And, and also this, this um, now a new problem, sort of like an, an environmental problem with yeah. the sea, you know, not just with these hurricanes, we've just had the, like in the Bahamas, but also with the problem of trash, with right. this, you know, pollution, on our beaches and pollution. And, and, and um, because we're surrounded by the sea too, we get all the effects of how other people misuse nature, right. you know. I, as I was also reading the, the book, that so many of the short stories can be longer narratives. And I was curious about your perspective on what makes a short story a short story. Like how do you tie it up and make it so concise and, and satisfying when it closes? Oh, um, well, a bunch of years ago, I heard someone say that it, like a short story is like, okay, a novel is like a marriage and a short story is a date. Oh. <laughs> I like that, I like that a lot. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know, sometimes it's like a short marriage. <laughs> right, when you might uh, get an old. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like one of those Kadarshan marriages. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying, folks, I'm trying. I don't even think I pronounced that properly. <laughs> but um, but another another image I like is um, is a is like of a of a short story as a as a painting, mm. right? And um, and so when you're looking at like a beautiful painting, um, like a Omar Bearden or like one or you know Milo Jones, like. When you're looking at those paintings, I mean, so many I could name that I could visually see right now. You're you're looking at the painting, and you're you're just like you're you're falling into it, mm. right? You could stand there, like there's some that you can stand there all like for hours looking at, yeah. and you could still find something new. And then, but you know, there's something like in that image that there's something that happened before, and right. you know there's something that happens after, but you're just you're in the moment at that time. 
And um, so I feel like, you know, short stories, some short stories are very short, some short stories are longer, but it's, you get that feeling of like a complete experience, mm. just like a, a, a wonderful poem, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, and it's okay to want more. And I think that's the, that's the criticism of people who hate short stories will be like, darn it, I just like, they're like, I was just getting into it when it ended. <laughs> They, people get mad about that. They're like, well, I was just getting into it. I was like, well, it continues in your imagination. Right, you know? right, right. I, I think, well, I have a little bit of ADD, so I, I love short stories. <laughs> like, yeah, me too. Like, me too. Yeah. It feels so satisfying to go through. I'm like, okay, I'm done with this one. What's next? Yeah. So, you know? And I, and I know people, and I always advise people, like, don't skip around. That, like, there's an ac architecture to it yes, like that yeah. a lot of thought was put into the yeah. order you know so. Oh, so, so you just asked your my next question yeah, <laughs> yeah so t tell us about the architecture and how you curated the stories together well um i decided with for sure like not to do because sometimes when you do a short story collection you're like okay i have 10 stories i'm gonna do a book <laughs> and so i this time i purse i didn't do all the stories i have like i felt like I wanted to do an even number of stories, yeah. like eight stories, and I wanted, like, they have a common thread, yeah. right? Um, they're essentially, I think, um, love stories. Yeah. And not romantic, necessarily all just romantic love, but love of family, love of country, com very complicated love. Yeah. And, um, but also I wanted them to have music, mm -hmm. you know? There's, there's um, in the story without inspection, there's a Haitian, yeah. Folk song, like Tibonito, there's Nina Simone, there's um, Charles Mengus's Haitian fight song yeah. in there. So I really wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to sing in some ways and I wanted to have like rituals that go through. Mm -hmm. And so, and I felt like these stories, they came together and they kind of build up yeah. in, in, in this way. But I, I, I mean, aside from the fact that it's one person, that's like the same person who's written them, I always feel like I like to find echoes when I read mm -hmm. different, you know, stories in a in a book. So that was it's that's done with all of that in mind. You know? uh, yes, it was well, brilliantly done. There is I, I like the that phrase echoes because it does it does do that. They they kind of call to each other. Um, in a really concise way. The, the story in which um, there's a story within the story. Oh, yeah. yeah. Seven stories. Seven stories. Yeah. Um, can, can you tell without, you know, I'm not going to give any spoilers. Read the book, everyone. Um, but can we talk about how you constructed that? When, and, and that's a, a theme, that's something you've done before, you know, like a stories within stories. Like, how do you do that in a way that it still makes sense and the reader isn't taken out of one story or lost in any way? Like, you can still follow what's happening. Yeah. Well, the seven stories, actually that story came out of an experience that I had when, when I was, like, 14. Is that real? That was a real story? Oh, well, I'm not going to say. Oh, okay. Because okay. <laughs> some people might recognize themselves. But, <laughs> but, um, but when, I, when I was 14 years old in, in Brooklyn, we lived in this apartment building, and then suddenly across the hall from us, um, it was during the dictatorship, these very famous, like, Haitian musicians were exiled and moved right across the, the hall from us. Oh, wow. We didn't, like, we didn't know who they were exactly, mm -hmm. but, they, but they, you know, they had a lot of visitors. Mm -hmm. And it was strange because later on, some of the people who came to visit them were people that I would meet in my life, and they'd be like, oh, well, we lived across the hall. <laughs> and so and then they became politicians later on to mixed effect. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, um, and that's, that has always stayed with me. Like yeah. suddenly these people, like they land, it was, seemed very all very glamorous. Mm -hmm. So I decided to write about, but two little, like two women who meet when they're girls, when one of them is exiled yeah. from an island that is not named. And then the, the one, then the older, then the one who goes back home becomes the wife of the prime minister. And, and so she invites her young friend back, who's now a writer. That's not my life, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so but, but the whole thing, I mean, it's also like trying to write about a place. I mean, this happens with Haiti all the time where mm -hmm. people show up, they like spend a week and they're like, I'm an expert on Haiti. Right. So I, I felt like 
I felt like it was interesting to like flip it to like this Haitian woman goes somewhere else and she's now supposed to be an expert on that. Yeah. You know, and you know this, you probably get those things where people want you to write your 1500 words on everything, like, yeah. you know, just be, <laughs> because you're in this body, they're like, okay, so you'll be an expert at this thing. Right, and you're right. like, I don't know anything about that thing, you know? Yeah. And so, but this woman, it's like, she's sort of addressing, she goes into the story with work, but also because she's very intrigued by these people. And, um, and so I, the story within the story is like, she wrote this essay that then, that the prime minister's wife is very intrigued with and wants her to write more, but it's like seducing her with like a very glamorous tour of the island that, yeah. yeah. Well, I definitely try to Google. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, is this real? Um, yeah, yeah. It was just again so, so well done, and it made the the reader just be like, okay, like what what is reality in this? Even though reading it, you know, it's fiction, but it just feels so real. And if it, and I love that when you're reading something when you're just taken away, and this is like this is now my reality, and I want to know more about it. Mm -hmm. um, I. I I also want to talk about how, just a little bit more about your craft and process and how you like visualize characters. And you spoke a little bit earlier about um, you, as you said, you, you inhabit the pain as you're like writing it. You feel it very viscerally. Is that true for every character? Like when you were writing uh, Nadia in the old day, like how, how do you come to, to bring them alive on the page? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I have to I have to see them for myself. And I, I think that's to me the first thing. Like yeah. I. I have to, they almost have to be like people I know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even, I think as readers, we have that experience where we read a character and we're like, oh, I know this person in this book more than I know people in my life. Yeah. Because um, there's also this, the intimacy between a reader and a writer that sometimes we don't have with real people. Yeah, well you can see right? more on the page. Like you can exactly. like, yeah, you can yeah. hear their inner thoughts. Exactly, like you're, you're hearing everything. And so I think that's the challenge too of like of the conflicting inner thoughts and sometimes when it's people you don't like their inner thoughts right, <laughs> right. <laughs> you're like, you're like i don't like to, it's like i don't want to be in this person's head at all mm -hmm. and but you still have to show the same kind of love right to, or is, is it like a respect you think yeah i yeah. think i think you have to like for me i have to fully understand it it's like yeah. when i was writing about this man who like the the do in the do breaker mm -hmm. like you know writing about a person who was like the devil to us right. in our reality. It was like who had tortured people. But even with that person, you you have to think, oh, someone loves him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And okay. and then you, I mean, unless you want to write f like about the person in a flat way, mm -hmm. you still have to give that person some humanity. Like yeah. you don't have, they don't have your blessing, they don't have your stamp of approval, but you still have to kind of understand how they came to be the way they are in order to write f about them as fully human. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, could you comment on the language <laughs> usage? I guess you're trilingual with English, French, and, and Creole. And how do you think when you're getting ready to write your stories? Well, I, I often think that it's almost like, a, for me, it's like a, almost a simultaneous translation, right? And then, um, in some of the stories, like of course the stories that are set here with the characters, or Haitian American, they'll speak English, but with some Creole. And um, but there in some of the stories, like the, where the characters are speaking um, Creole, then you know it's just simultaneously translated. But you also, but I try to capture so like the essence of what they're saying, so that even if you don't um, speak, you, like you you realize through the the way the dialogue is that they're speaking that they're speaking Creole, but I I had you know moments where I feel like oh should I leave the Creole in and and also being very conscious of people who are like me or like my brothers who speak both languages so I don't want to just repeat the word so we'll try to find like a more poetic version of it so like for Dewbreaker the 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 word in Creole is shuket la ose so it literally means someone who shakes the dew. Um, right, and but that's the you know that's also the beauty of the, the the language is that we give this beautiful name to someone who tortures people, right? right yeah. um, Shuket la Ose. Um and um, so you try. So I try to come up with a with a like a almost like a new way of saying it that someone who already speaks the language wouldn't feel like it's being repeated. Como <laughs> 
Oh, Bobby Man. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say it's so just an honor to be just in your presence. Um, I started with your first book, Brother, I'm Dying in High School, and I'm Haitian American, born in Port-au-Prince, so this is incredible for me. And um, I was also in a Haiti earthquake um, in 2010, and it's going almost going to be 10 years now in January. Do you currently have any projects that you're going to be working on, or is there anything that you probably can um, that I should also be doing, or you recommend other Haitians in the yeah. diaspora to be to do in order for us to you know get together for this unfortunate um, event? Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Messi Pil. I mean, the 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 sad thing with the earthquake anniversary approaching is that we're kind of living an earthquake right now, right, of, of sorts with what's happening in the country right now with, with the demonstrations, with the fuel, with the protest, and um, it's, a very, it's a very difficult time in, in, in Haiti right now. And so I, we, I'm on the board of the Santuda in Haiti, and one of the things we were thinking of doing is um, right after the earthquake, um, well, I, there was two projects I worked. There was one with, um, called with, with a group of people. We, we worked with teachers who were in the tent camps and who read to children, um, and so and and you know who had classes with the kids while they were displaced, and and then in, um, in the Santo Ada, they worked on a project with with also with children to draw. You know, and so we were going to revisit and see where the children were now, but it's been a little bit hard to travel to recent with with the recent events. But that's one of the things. But I I would encourage people in the diaspora to, you know, contribute in whatever way you you can, especially um, young people. And I think now there's so many ways that you can communicate with young people your age and who are in Haiti, and they're so dynamic. I mean, they're so, you know, if you when you meet with like the young poets or young artists, it's just, I mean, it's, it's nothing like you hear about here, even with everything that's going on, you know, they're so, they're so passionate about, about their art, you know, and all of that, again, sometimes very difficult day-to-day -day, uh, situation. So I would say make that connection, you know, start with people in your family. There are a lot of people who have projects and, and not just doing that, that period of the anniversary, but I think, to maintain that connection, especially with young people, they're they're really they 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 want that they want it whether it's on WhatsApp whether it's in person whether whatever ways they want it they they really desire it and and so a young men like yourself if you you know they would love to connect with you and also younger um, Haitian Americans or here there are community groups that you can join I think there's a very good I forget is anybody from the Philadelphia group here with them no not tonight. But, um, you know, we'll talk after. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I am ma ma actually married to a Haitian American. So the only thing I know is sac passe. That's the only thing I know. <laughs> that's, but, that's, um, all that's all you were taught. That's all he ever taught me. <laughs> but I have to say, I am a first generation um, American. My parents are Jamaican. I actually grew up in Brooklyn, right by where you grew up. So I know the high school that you went to was Clara Barton High School. And it was focused on nursing. And my question to you is, how did you get into writing? Because I know, coming from a Jamaican household, mm -hmm. and, my, and my husband's parents are Haitian, they push their children to either be a doctor, yes. a lawyer, or an accountant or teacher. And if you were not one of the four, you were totally disowned. <laughs> so I, I want to know, how did you get in, involved with writing, and what inspired you, and how did your family receive that? Well, I'll tell you how important it, it was for my parents that I was in, med like in medicine in some way. So I got into another high school, Erasmus Hall High School. So my dad went to the principal at Clara Barton High School, and, and I had only been in this country about two years, and he said, my daughter has to go to this high school because she's gonna be a doctor. So <laughs> not, not only did I, the principal was so moved, they put me in like the honors program. <laughs> and so when I graduated from Clara Barton High School, I, I was like a nurse's assistant. Like I could take care of one, not now, so no. <laughs> but, but I could have had a job working with people like as a, a kind of a, nur like a nurse's assistant. I volunteered in the hospitals a couple of times a week. But all the time that I was doing it, it was confirming for me like I wanted, I, like 
my, so my dad used to say, I was like, well, I want to be a, da a writer. But if you say to a Haitian family, like uh, people of my parents' generation, it's not like a, it wasn't even about money. It was like writers were killed. So they were like, no, it's not a good idea. <laughs> and so, but, but it was, so I, I, but I was writing and my dad would say, you can write on the weekend after brain surgery. <laughs> and, and, I, and I swear to you, on, on my father's deathbed, he was like, I'm not going to have a doctor. <laughs> yeah. And, and when, I, when, when I was on Oprah with the breath, breath, eyes, memory, he's like, now you'll have money for medical school. <laughs> so he, he never got over it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Edwin, bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> My question to you is this. Uh, do you ever think about writing a book about Toussaint Louverture? Okay, Toussaint Louverture, the great Toussaint Louverture, who's one of our founding um, fathers. When you said that, I was thinking of Ntozaki Shange, another wonderful writer um, who recently uh, passed away in her poem about Toussaint Louverture. Um, I, did, I don't think I, I want to write a, a book about Toussaint Louverture because I feel like there's been a lot of books written about Toussaint Louverture by great historians, wonderful poems, like in Tazaki Shange's poem, which is actually about, um, which is a wonderful tie to Toussaint Louverture because she's talking about like not, refi like because she was n not taught about Toussaint Louverture and her love for him for not being taught about him. But I, I was always more interested in the history people don't know, right? Like I feel like so many people already know, Wordsworth wrote a poem about Toussaint Louverture. And, uh, so for example, if I were to write about the Haitian Revolution, I would write about Sanit Belair, I would write about the women of the Haitian Revolution, for example, because I feel like people don't know as much about them. But I, but I love and respect Toussaint Louverture, for sure. Yeah. Hi, um, this question is for both of you guys. Would you guys ever work on like um, a joint project, maybe like a, Haitian-American, well-read <laughs> black girl festival in Haiti? <laughs> well, my answer is yes. <laughs> sure. And we're kind of actually... Um, tell, tell the folks about your black girl. Yeah, yes, well yes. Black girl. So, yeah. so I, um, I do have my anthology, Well Read Black Girl, and uh, it came out last year. Tell them about the whole movie. <laughs> okay, okay, Start okay. At the beginning. Oh my because God. she's done something really uh, incredible with Well Read Black Girl. Yes, so start you, at the you beginning. You were so yeah, loving. Yeah, so you, she has been a supporter from the very, very, very beginning when it was like four people, <laughs> you know? And it's now grown to um, a large community online. We have 1,000 people thousands of people that follow us on Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter, but it really started with just like the love of black literature and reading the crafts and the words of black women and how it can influence us in our everyday lives. Just like reading works of art and understanding it and then being able to apply it to our lives. So we have a festival and we have um, book club meetings throughout the country. Um, you can have a book club at your uh, local bookstore, like Uncle Bobby's here, and uh, just read books by black women. And it's really about amplifying their work and being, making sure that you buy them in bookstores and you support and understand the legacy of women like you. <laughs> and then sh there's an anthology. And there's an anthology, I know. I'm not a very good sell. I'm not, <laughs> um, I just really like reading and it transformed into something completely beyond my wildest dreams. And now I'm working on a second anthology that's actually looking at short story collections. And you guys are the first to know because I actually haven't announced that yet. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm working on more books and researching and really looking at the digital archives of black women writers and how we can continue to preserve the literary tradition. So that has become my passion and my purpose. And it really started with you know, the, the first book, Toni Morrison, um, The Bluest Eye, and has, has you know, so it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's beautiful. So the festival this year is going to be in Brooklyn, New York on November 2nd. And it's our third year. Yeah, the third year. Yeah, the first two, it, they were great. I don't know how I did it, but this year I actually feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you. So come, it's a yeah, tra come, short yeah. train right away. Yes, <laughs> yes, please, please come. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Um, so my name's Claudia, I'm from Queens, New York. Um, my question for you is, um, when I moved here in um, 2005, it was a lot of adjustment for me, getting adjusted to the New York life, living in the apartment, as opposed to my life in Haiti. 
and now um, it's kind of hard having to immerse myself here and still keeping in touch with what's going on back home. So my question for you is, did you experience something similar and how did you um, counteract that? Kind of like this living in limbo stage that I think a lot of immigrants people face. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when I, when I moved here at 12, it was like 1981, we couldn't go back for many reasons because there were uh, six of us, you know, my, my parents and my brothers, and there's just no, we couldn't afford like those plane tickets. Even though my dad had this really sad thing that Haitian parents at that time did, he was like, one of my brothers was especially like would misbehave. He would literally like drive him to the airport. It's like I'm sending you, <laughs> like, which was not good for my brother's love of Haiti. <laughs> but, but he would always, and I remember thinking, send me, send me. <laughs> um, but. Um, we just couldn't afford to go, and it was also the dictatorship, like my parents were not gonna go, so, I've, so we started. So there was that, I think that made it a little, like because you could, we, couldn't, we couldn't go, and I went when I became an adult, like after, like after post-1986, I went on my own. Um, and so I think the adjustment, um, it's probably, you have a lot more resources probably now, there's like a bigger Haitian community, there are bigger people who know like, when I, sometimes when I, when I got here, when I was telling people I was from Haiti, they would say, Tahiti? <laughs> <laughs> like, the, like they didn't even know where Haiti, where Haiti was. So I think there's, I would say, you know, uh, just find community. And, and sometimes community is, it could be community of other immigrants who are, who are feeling very, that, that same thing that you are feeling. Um, you know, just, just find community wherever you can get it. This is like community tonight. It's like the beloved community, you know, just look for that. And, and sometimes it doesn't sound like you, it sometimes doesn't look like you, but whatever, you know, just wherever you are, find community. Um, it seems to me that over the years, there are different groups who produce phenomenal literature in clusters, whether it's WASP literature, I think in the, the 50s, 60s, it was Jewish literature. A Jewish writer, it seems that right now, the past 10 years and now, there's been this huge um, outpouring of literature from black writers. Um, is there any reason this has happened? Or is it just a ph the phenomenon, they, they, they're, they're producing the most beautiful, wonderful literature, and it's, it's predominant in, in America and other countries now. Is there any reason this has flourished like this? <laughs> I think we've always had this beautiful literature. Oh, yeah. right? We've always no, had it. Of course, I don't yeah. mean that. I mean the the the. I, of course, and there's always been good literature by uh, all kinds of cultures. It's just that right now the the predominance that it it seems to predominate all literature. I did not mean that it, that there weren't good writers before. No, but I think you know. I think from the you know from the time eternal, right? A wonderful civilization. We come from storytellers. I think maybe um, now the distribution might be a little more democratic because like you couldn't have started. Yeah, this, you know, yeah if I had done girl, this yeah. like five years ago or 10 years ago, I don't think it would have had the same impact, but because of technology and because of the, we, I feel like people have more access and that we can make it more democratic and egalitarian yeah. and we, our voices are just louder uh, yeah. in, the, in the publishing industry and otherwise. I mean, they've always, you know what, actually take that back. It's always been loud, yeah. but it's, it's just like that there's just like more pathways. Well, you can create the you, yeah, but I but I also like we have a living manifestation of that in our midst. Yeah, right. Yes, so yes. Sonia Sanchez is here. Sonia Sanchez. Yes. And and I just want to end by saying we love you. Yes. We honor you. We respect you, and you're ours. <laughs> Thank you. So we will be signing books upstairs. Um, and we just, again, thank you to Philadelphia and the community. Andy, thank you, everyone here. This has been an incredible conversation. Thank you. Thank you.